Okay, welcome. Thanks for joining us after lunch. It's a tough act to follow, but we'll, we're gonna do our best. So I am pleased to introduce Steve. And uh, the way I would introduce Steve is, many of you might have heard Vinod's take on boards. And some of you might have heard Vinod say, ignore everything your board says. And you know, I hate boards and they're counterproductive. I asked Vinod, what, what did he think about Steve? And he's, the first thing he said is, we should have Steve on every board we can. And, and After I, he said boards are worthless, so just <laughs> kind of like figure that one out. With some exceptions. So uh, we're here to get some more hands-on knowledge from someone who's seen more than most people have uh, ever been exposed to about building startups. And we're gonna take a little more practical, hands-on approach to what can you take away from this event uh, to help you in your actual situation at companies. And we're gonna try to leave some time for questions, but we're gonna start with me asking some questions. Before I dive into that, having said the, the one distinguishing attribute of your unique among humans on Earth, as characterized by Vinod as being a good board member, what else would you tell the audience about your background that will help us understand the rest of the answers to the questions? Well, I think the most relevant one was eight startups in 21 years, uh, last couple as a co-founder, founder, um, and uh, box score at the end of my career was uh, uh, four, four IPOs, uh, but more importantly, two craters so deep they left their own iridium layer, which uh, for those of you who aren't geologists, you could ask someone else, but it meant I, I lost a lot of VC's money. In fact, the next to last startup, uh, I lost $35 million. That's before that was considered a seed round. Um, <laughs> and uh, I had a call, and I was on the cover of Wired when I re realized uh, we were about to lose all the money. And so I had to call my mother, who was a Russian immigrant. English wasn't her first language. And uh, she always had to translate in her, in her head, so there was a pause. Um, this is before uh, Echo. Um, and I said, Mom, I lost $35 million. Pause, translate. She logically said, where'd you put it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, 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 it, it's gone. It's like, you know, like I spent it. And then she like broke into some languages I didn't even understand, which was, you know, the country we came from is gone. There's nowhere else for, to, for us to go. And then she really thought about it and said, and her last name is blank. We can't even change it. Um, and I said, now the reason I'm calling you is the people who gave me $35 million just gave me another $12 million to do my next one. And there was a long pause. And she said, they always told us the streets were paved with gold in America, and I never believed her. And the reason I tell you the story is, in my last startup, which was right after the failure, I turned that uh, $12 million into a billion dollars each for my two investors, went home, retired, and then started thinking about the nature of innovation and entrepreneurship, which was what I've done for the last 15, 20 years now. And in fact, my work, Eric Reese's work, and Osterwalder's work uh, all became what's called a lean startup. And so the notion of uh, how we think about innovation and entrepreneurship in the 21st century is very different from when I was an entrepreneur uh, in the 20th, which was you know, basically VCs, whether they would set it or not, in fact, we didn't even have the language, said startups are nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. So large companies write business plans, we want from you, one from you. Large companies write five-year plans and forecasts that all say 100 million in five years. We want to see the same thing from you. And by the way, you know, you, we funded the plan, so to now go execute the plan if you deviate from the plan. Or worse, if you fail to execute the plan, it's obviously your fault as the founder. We'll start firing your VP of sales, VP of marketing, and then you, if you're lucky, get to be chief something, but you're out. Um, maybe some VCs still do that, but we now know that's not the optimum path. So my career has been as a, as a practitioner, I mean, a rapacious and relentless practitioner, um, and now kind of as thinking about what that all meant and is there a better way to do it. So what was your question? Hmm. I think we start with who are you? Maybe yeah. we could dive a little bit into the lean startup idea. It, obviously some parts of it when you developed it, well maybe most of it was very counterintuitive in business globally. And now some of it's become adopted in kind of mainstream thinking in Silicon Valley. What parts of it are least well understood or least appreciated today? 
Well, I, I think you've been hearing pieces of it from, in fact, uh, you were all at lunch hearing Bezos. I mean, he basically talked about lean stuff without actually using uh, kind of those words. Some of the basic principles are, you know, you all, how many of you, all founders in the room? How many founders in the room? Right? How many of you think you're visionaries? Put up your damn hands, damn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we now have enough data to go, I'd say 98% of you are actually hallucinating. It's a big idea. Sorry. Every founder thinks they're a visionary. The, the, the problem is, is that what you're really starting with is mostly a series of untested hypotheses. That's the big idea, is the whole idea of lean was in, in the 20th century, we assumed that startups were smaller versions of large companies, not understanding that large companies are executing known business models. They got large because they figured out who their customers were, pricing channels, understood competition, what, pro what we now call product market fit. But startups are none of those. You're actually searching for a business model. You have a series of hypotheses about this tech will actually scale and work, and these will be the customers, and this is the pricing, and all I need to do is scale the sales force or build out the product, and the only problem I'm going to have if I'm a visionary is the building big enough to hold the bags of money that will obviously come. And it never works that way. In fact, you know, if you really dig through the statistics, I'd say less than 10% of startups, maybe even less, end up executing the same business model that they originally started with. And the real question, question is, is, well, how did they go from X to Y? How did the survivors kind of figure out what the right path was? And, and uh, for me, that's the job of the practitioner who now has a lot more tools than they had in the 20th century to actually figure out how to do that. It's, it's not just luck, and it's not just you know, gut skill. There is a, a methodology that one could use to kind of figure this out. And, and just as an aside, um, you know, I did not come from the technologist side. I was a marketeer my entire career, which meant I could explain fairly complicated things to my mother. You know, I did two semiconductor companies, a couple of supercomputer companies, enterprise software, a whole variety of things. Um, but my skill was kind of trying to understand what it all meant. And it required both understanding what the technology meant, but it also required a deep understanding of customers at the same time. You mentioned how most startups evolve what their plan is. Let's talk about that some, because one of the things that I find most challenging in advising uh, founders is the uh, dilemma of when to stay stubborn and relentless, and it's, you know success is on iteration 17, and when to, the, the word people use now is pivot, when to really change. So how do you know which to do? Is anybody who hasn't heard the word pivot? Right. So, you know, that's the 21st century's excuse for attention deficit disorder. It's a joke. You're supposed to laugh, right? <laughs> it meant, oh, I got another idea. Let's go try this one. Uh, but at least in my definition, a pivot is a substantive change to one or more components of your business model. It's very simple. Anybody use Osterwalder or seen Osterwalder's business model canvas? If you haven't seen it, you ought to all download the book or buy it. It's called Business Model Design by Alexander Osterwalder. And in a single piece of paper, single diagram, it lays out for any founder the eight things that you ought to be worrying about. Who are my customer segments? What value proposition? That is, what products and services am I building for them? That combination we call product market fit. What channels am I using? How do I get, keep, and grow customers? What's my revenue strategy and what's my pricing tactics? What activities do I need to be expert in? What resources do I need internally? What partners do I need externally? And what are my costs? Those are the things that you're always kind of thinking about, whether you're using the canvas or just something else. I, I happen to love the canvas because it, again, gives us a, a common framework and language to start thinking about strategy. And so a pivot allows us to say, well, wait a minute. Those customers aren't over here. They're over here. Or, Wait a minute, that's the wrong channel. Or, no, our product and service is not really you know, talking dolls. In fact, we're Zorin. Yeah, yeah. There it is. A classic pivot is like, no, our business is over here. And we can now use partners who didn't even know they were our partners, like Alexa and, and, and Google, uh, and uh, Amazon Echo and, and Google Alexa. Or do I got them right? Um, and, and all of a sudden, your business model changes. So pivot is that substantive change. 
But the real genius of a, of a founder is not <laughs> letting it happen to you, but being able to actually discover it before you run out of money. I always thought of my job, and it is a little different in the 21st century, because we were always running out of money, is I had a virtual gun to my head called burn rate. And, and you know the clock was ticking. I either had to raise more money or, God forbid, actually get revenue uh, that actually got me into cash flow positive. And that's what I was worried about all the time, all the time, is what was the right product market fit where I could either scale customers or revenue or something. And in the beginning, I was trying to figure out what the right match was. And now I realize there's a strategy that you could all use to do that. So tell us some more about that. In particular, what, what would be some tools that people can think about to know whether to stay relentlessly dogged on the same path or change paths? So one of the things I found about winning CEOs is, uh, and, and, and I have to tell you, it's very funny, because I, I teach both in business schools and in engineering schools, and my class has become the standard for commercialization for all science in the United States through the National Science Foundation. My Stanford class is now called the i -Corps or Innovation Core, where if you want an SBIR grant from the NSF, you have to take it. And so I teach scientists who believe, hey, all we need to do is to like, get money, and this technology will scale, and gee, everybody will run out and buy bags of graphene. You know, like, trust me, that was the hot thing. Graphene won a Nobel Prize, and all these graphene scientists thought they could get funding, and before no one figured out what you do with bags of graphene. Um, number one is, um, even though you got funded to do X, you need to understand a much broader area than just your space. And what I mean by that is my last company, I just got out and went to a lot of trade shows and conferences for a couple of reasons. One is I needed to see what all my competitors were doing in the flesh. And not just, you know, like, yeah, I read about them or I got some slides or some competitive analysis. I needed to stand in their booth until I could demo their product. Seriously. Right? And I needed to see everybody else. And more importantly, and, and by the way, this is not I needed to show up at a conference to speak. I, I didn't even want anybody to know I was there. Number two is I needed to see what all the analysts about that space were drawing about the current space and where it was going. One is so I could use their language when I wanted to raise money to VCs who were reading the same stuff. And two is to laugh hysterically going, they don't know what's coming down on them. But I needed to understand the battlefield. I needed to understand more than just my tech, more than just my competitors, but I needed to understand them deeply. And I needed to start thinking about what are the economics of the winning game? Because the trap is, OK, I now understand my competitors. That's who I'm focused on. I have to tell you, number one is if you're focused on other startups, you're already on a losing game. And if you're worrying about the large incumbents, you're driving with the rearview mirror. You need to figure out kind of what's the, what's the economics, what's the air supply, meaning where can you cut off the air. I, one of the key things for me was discovering in my last company that the two components of air supply was owning uh, the CIO and owning the head of an operating division. And how do you do that? Well, back in the 20th century, owning the CIO meant owning two magazines, Computer World and CIO Magazine. I won't tell you how, but at the end, I was the only company they invited to their conferences. Everything else was CIOs and Computer World. And the other one was who was the, you know, the best kind of had mind share for the operating side. And it was back then, it was a guy named Don Peppers, and it was one to one marketing. Overnight, Don owned a quarter percent of my company, and I was the only one who followed him in his speech when he filled up a room of 5,000 people at a trade show. I had the last 15 minutes. How did that happen? What well, happened? Because I understood the ecosystem of, of the space and who I needed to partner with and who I needed to shut out. Um, and then I needed to, as I said, to understand the economics. Um, and then we kind of used what became the lean methodology uh, to kind of test a series of hypotheses. Yeah, I believe this is our channel, and I believe you know, these are the features we want, but they were just hypotheses. So how do I run some rapid tests? First, customer discovery, getting out of the building and actually talking to people with what we call minimum viable products. A minimum viable product is something that gets you the most learning at any one point in time. It's not a prototype 
or defeatured product, it, it could be a spreadsheet or it could be something else. I'll give you a great example. I funded a set of ex students who were doing, you know, nowadays kind of standard, but putting hyperspectral scanners on drones, flying over farm fields, figuring out nutrients and water requirements down to a single plant. And, you know, they called me up after class, Professor Blank, we're raising a seed round, we, you know, want to kick in. And I said, how much are you raising? You know, they said, well, we're just raising a half a million bucks. And my first reaction was, you know, it's not too late for me to change your grade. And they went, what are you talking about? I said, didn't you get an A in the class? Yes, but we're, we're, and they repeated again what we're doing. Maybe you're old, don't remember, you know. Like, I said, no, I remember what you guys are doing. Why do you need a half a million bucks? And they repeated again. We need to, like, build a drone, and we need to test out the scanner. And what? I said, what business are you in? And they repeated again, farms and nutrients and whatever. What business were they really in? Anybody, what business were they in? Thank you. How do you build an MVP for data? All they needed to do was show a farmer a spreadsheet and say, is this worth, you know, and 100 bucks a month? They didn't need the drone. They didn't need the hyperspectral scanner. And when I told them that, they said, damn, we're engineers. We wanted to build a drone. Well, so they got out and did that. You know what they discovered? Anybody know what flies over farm fields in the United States constantly? Crop dusters. Turned out crop dusters were more than happy to put hyperspectral scanners on their airplanes, generated additional revenue, and yeah, they're still using drones as well, but now they had it in a whole additional channel. Never would have discovered that unless they got out of the building because they were so focused on building the hardware and the technology and whatever, they didn't understand what really mattered was A, did anybody care about their data, at least the price they wanted in their business model, and two, were there other potential partners and could they change the ecosystem from everybody else who was building drones for farming to understand that there were other partners that no one had figured out who were desperate for additional revenue themselves. Um, and then the other one is, the last piece is shape the battlefield. Um, and, and by shape it, and by the way, I'm using the battlefield analogies because my previous career was in the military and now I'm back working with the government, um, is to kind of shape perception. Y you know, uh, PR, uh, should not be thought of as how to make your mother proud that your name was in the press or speaking at a conference. PR is to kind of like screw with everybody's head and to make everybody believe that it's not worth going after you. And more importantly, make everybody believe that you have seen the future and they like just kind of missed it. And, and you need to convince people that you guys are the market leaders. Um, and, and I don't mean you know, PR about bullshit claims, but I mean once you understand where the space is, once you understand what customer needs are, uh, you could own these air supplies and bottlenecks. And then, can I keep going? Then just one last piece. Just tactically, internally, as you start growing, the, the real trap is as you go from eight people to 45 to, if you're so lucky, 150, you start hitting kind of cultural numbers of organization, and the tendency is to put process and procedure in place. And don't get me wrong, you always need process and procedure, but, but insight and innovation kind of comes from the edges. It, just as Jeff said, it doesn't come from like, okay, we got this formal process, and here's our new product planning process, and here's how we're shipping product A, B, and C. Um, you know, you want to organize kind of at the edge of chaos. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I ran marketing in a startup coming after Chapter 11, um, I, when I joined the company, said, who are our customers? And with 14 people in marketing, I got 38 answers. I went, well, don't we have any data from customers? Well, yeah. And so back then, this is pre-internet, people wheeled in a cart with 14,000 unprocessed registration cards. People used to mail back physical cards. I called 300 of them in a week and understood that 80% of our customers were in a single market, only used four applications and X, Y, Z, and knew more than like not only my own staff, but everybody else in the business. And I basically used that for the next three and a half years to go from 11 to 68% market share. Trust me, that was a lot of fun. Took the company public, just pummeled our competitors, not because we were smarter, we were kind of rapacious, but we had real data. But the point is, 
I made everyone in my staff, which got back down to four and then one went up to 40, call two customers a week. And the first thing we would discuss in our staff meeting is not coordination, not your status report, but I want everybody to talk about customers, about customers. And that's what we were talking about. And that's where this edge would come up. It's funny, they're using it like X, Y, and Z, but they said, too bad it doesn't have X. And I'd go, say that again. And, and, and sometimes the data's at the edges. Can I tell you one more edge story, and, and then I'll stop? Um, had a bunch of students going out, doing some of this customer discovery, talked to a lot of customers that were trying to figure out pricing. And they thought they had a great app. They were trying to price the app. They spoke to over three weeks, 50 some odd customers. And I, because I made them vlog their results, I knew what they were gonna say in class. I said, tell everybody what you found. Oh, our price for the app should be $9.99. What a surprise. I said, tell the class how you came up with that data. Well, we talked to, we did what you said. We got out of the building, we talked to 53 customers. That was the sum of the answers. Well, tell them how you summed the answers. Well, 47 people said 9.99. Tell the class what the data you threw out said. Oh, a couple crazy people said we've actually built some enterprise software that's worth $25,000. Well, well, why'd you throw out that data? Well, Professor Blank, 47 is bigger than, than six. You all should be going, holy shit, right? The data is at the edges, not in the center. And as the, if you're the CEO and you're not getting that data and you don't have a process to do it and you're not personally getting out of the building, uh, trust me, you are not gonna find the pivot into scale. If you are not personally capable of actually saying, you know, here's what I heard from X, Y, and Z and are depending on proxies, like you've hired a VP of sales and you hired a whatever and they go, don't worry your little head, we got this under control, trust me you will never find the right pivot. I don't mean you need to spend 100% of your time out there, but if you don't have a good ear for the space and a good view of the battle space, it's gonna be incredibly difficult for you to make those decisions. Sorry for the ramble. But. Let's hit on one other area and then we'll see if, if folks have questions. You have spent uh, decades observing entrepreneurs succeed and fail mm -hmm. and the most, um, painful thing I think to watch as an entrepreneur that could have succeeded that fails partly because of their own uh, both benefits and shortcomings but they fail to harness them the right way as the company grows because you got to start out with some crazy or you wouldn't be an entrepreneur but then as the company turns into a company you got to balance it and you've had some recent podcasts about entrepreneurs that don't always make that transition so here's a room full of entrepreneurs more than being CEOs or managers they're founders and entrepreneurs. So what advice would you give them to make that transition work? So, you know, you're gonna hear in this conference from me and whatever, a whole bunch of BS about pivots and whatever, you know, and sounds so easy when someone else is telling you, like, who, like, I mean, I remember hearing all this stuff and I was worried about, you know, my co-founder just quit, the largest customer just changed their mind, you know, the toilets are stopped up and I'm the, you know, facilities manager as well, and that was a good day. I don't know if that happened to any of you, but that was like what my days were like. This insight doesn't come in a memo. It's never clean. And so your skill as an entrepreneur is to be able to extract signals from noise. In fact, if you really think about it in modern language, if you have all this data coming in, big picture, tactical picture, fingertip feel of, of customers, uh, you're running a neural net on, a, on a, just an enormous set of data, and you're looking for that kind of click. Every once in a while, you'll get, holy crap, what if we actually go from selling to consumers to selling to enterprise? And then you start panicking going, but that would require firing our, yes, that's why you're CEO. Those are those tough kind of conversations you have to have, A, with yourself, and B, if you don't have an advisory board, you're screwed. Because sometimes you can't have that discussion with your co-founder who might be the person that needs to go, or gee, that's the last thing you want to call up your board with unless you've bounced it against someone else who's kind of lived this life. And so my other suggestion is tactically, you need a set of trusted advisors, and then you need to bounce it against a couple board members and never surprise your board when you're doing a pivot of that scale. 
But if you could back it up with evidence, it becomes an interesting conversation, because say that they've seen this movie before, but they're not you. They don't see what you're seeing. Well, I've heard you say that if, or at least try to ask the question, if the product were free, like if price was not an issue, would the customer sign up? What underlies that question? Well, you know, uh, depends what you're selling. This was a test I used to run in enterprise sales. Is, you, you know, you, I always wanted to get to either a yes or no pretty quickly. In, in enterprise sales, it's trying to figure out, you know, Who's the user? Who's the recommender? Who's the influencer? Who's the economic buyer, et cetera? Um, and let's say you've spent you know, four or five meetings, and you finally think you've found both a recommender who might actually be a decision maker, and you want to go figure out, is this something they want? And then you go, well, if it was free. Oh, if it was free, Steve, we'd put it on 1,000 seats. We'd be using it. OK. Now you just understand the only thing you're negotiating is the price. It's like when your VC says, OK, you know, what's your valuation? My response always would be, great, are we done with the term sheet? And we're just arguing about the price? OK. And usually there's not. Usually that flushes out a whole set of other issues about who you need to talk to, what the other conditions are, who else are the other players. You know, this example you used about the, uh, the company that was starting that wanted to gather data, that uh, originally wanted to build drones to get the data, but then figured out they could gather the data from existing crop dusters. To me, that, of all the things you said, that's the most inspirational to me. The way I think about that is just finding a, a, a door rather than trying to go through a wall. And it also integrates these two perspectives. Like if one can, if the goal of the company is to gather data and enhance the way, in that case, farmers make decisions, the business wasn't it wasn't really a fundamental pivot to not build drones. It was just a better way to accomplish the original goal. And to me, the more we can find that kind of balance where we're staying true to our mission, but finding the door, <laughs> if that's what the pivot is, is a, just a smarter way to accomplish the task, that, that kind of melds these two right. perspectives. All right, and, and uh, I'll not only agree, but double down. If you think about what a business model is, again, all the components for you to do that, who's the customer, what's the channel, what's the pricing, et cetera, all those weren't given to you on day one, even what features are you're building in what order. What you're looking for is, you know, how do I get to that end point by removing all those obstacles in the way? And all those obstacles might be simply your preconceptions about how to deliver that value to vision. Um, and, and as I said, on day one, most of them are fundamentally wrong. And the joke is, if we knew what was wrong, we wouldn't do it on day one. That is, we would actually execute the correct plan. But it's up to you as the founder to figure out what that is and how to rapidly do that before you run out of money or, or something else happens. Um, or God forbid, end up in the land of the living dead, which I did for a couple of years. It's good so, to stay away from the land right. of the living dead. OK, right. on that note, thank you, Steve. Right. Uh, we will try to stay alive and uh, do as small pivots in as smart a way possible and build great companies. Thank great. you. Thank you. Thank you.